Well, good morning and welcome to South Point where we're one church in multiple locations. I want to say good morning to our Leonard Town campus. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? I want to say good morning to our Lesby campus. I want to say good morning to those who watch on our YouTube channel. Um, we're just so glad that you chose to be with us today. Hey, we're in week four of our series called Double. Now, if you've missed any of these, there's a reason why we named this series called Double. The reason we named it Double is, is for a reason, is there's a me I want to be. Matter of fact, we're going to put it up on the screen. It says, there's a me I want to be. Raise your hand if there's a me you want to be. Like, there's a me that we all want to be, and then there's a me that I am, and sometimes there's a gap between the me that I want to be and the me that I am. That's why we named the series Double. Now, before I dive into today's kind of message, I, I want to kind of recap. I kind of want to go, hey, why is what we're talking about so important today? Why is becoming the me I want to be so, so important? So here's what I need you to do. I need you to, like, if you're looking at the bulletin, you do something else, I need you to kind of put that down. I need you to kind of, like, just, like, take your ear and kind of just drive in and because you're not going to want to miss this. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine the people that you like and the people that you care about. I want you to imagine them having a conversation about you, except you are not around. And here's what I want you to imagine. What is it that you want those people that you care about to say about you? I want you to imagine what your spouse would say. I want you to imagine what your kid would say. I want you to imagine what would your co-worker say. I want you to imagine what would your parents say. What would your neighbor say? I mean, this is why it's so important. Imagine, imagine this. Imagine your friends invite you. They invite you out to eat, right? Your friends invite you. And you say, hey, listen, I can't make it. I have this other engagement, but thanks for inviting me. And then this other engagement gets canceled. And so you show up to this restaurant where all your friends are gathered and it's kind of busy and noisy. So they don't notice that you're there. And as you walk up on the table, your friends, you hear them talking about you. What is it that you hope that they would say? I bet for most of us, we'd hope that our friends would say, man, that person is a good friend. They're loyal. They're always, you know, they're just a good person. They always have nice things to say. Imagine, imagine your spouse, imagine your spouse, whether it's a he or she, imagine your spouse is out. And then they're with a friend and they're having a cup of coffee at the coffee house. And you didn't know that they were doing it this day and you happen to show up to the coffee place. And you see them talking and you think you're going to sneak up. And you actually hear your spouse talking about you. Imagine, what is it that you would want your spouse to say about you? Would you want to hear your spouse say, he is so faithful. She is so kind. I'm proud to have them as my husband or my wife, and they're a great parent. They help out around. I mean, what is it that you imagine hearing your spouse saying if you weren't there? Imagine your coworkers. You're at work, and they're all gathered around the water cooler. I don't know. Does anyone actually have a water cooler at work? I don't know if this thing still exists. But imagine the imaginary water cooler where your friends gather around. Maybe it's the coffee pot and the soda machine nowadays, right? So imagine the coworkers are there at the soda machine or the coffee machine. And they don't see you coming, but they're talking about you. Imagine, what is it that you'd want them to say? Would you want them to say, man, that person's hardworking. That person, you know, they're a person of integrity. They always do the right thing. They always have a smile on their face. Imagine at a family wedding, your parents are there and they're talking to someone. They don't see you coming up behind them. What is it that you would imagine or hope that your parents would say about you? I'm so proud of the kind of person that they've become that they do the right thing regardless of how hard it is. They are generous. And they are compassionate. Imagine you're at a cookout, a community little cookout with all your neighbors in your neighborhood. And there's a couple of close neighbors there and they're all talking. And they're talking about you. What is it that you would hope or imagine that they would say? Man, that person's really kind. Do you notice how they're always so helpful? Imagine what your kid would say if you weren't there to some of their friends. Maybe they're in elementary school or maybe early middle school and they're, they're at a birthday party and you happen to show up a little bit early to pick them up and you overhear them talking with their friends. What is it that you would hope they say? Would you hope that they say, man, my parents, they're cool, they're hard, but they're fair. They're patient. And I know that they are for me. You see, here's the truth. All of us, all of us want 
And all of us would hope that those that we care about would speak well of us. That's why what we're talking about, becoming the me I want to be, is so, so important. And I didn't want us today to forget why it's so important that we're talking about the me I want to be and the difference between there's the me I am. Now, here's kind of the funny thing. You and I aren't the first people to actually struggle with this. Matter of fact, every generation has to wrestle with this. Matter of fact, back in the 1800s, the early 1800s, the generation was dealing with this. And matter of fact, as they were dealing with this, there became this parable that was really popular. Now, we don't know where this parable came from. We don't know if it came from the indigenous people group that was on this continent we call the Americas, or if it came from up north in the Eskimo. All we know, it's a parable that got, became very popularized in the 1800s. Maybe you've ever heard of it because it's it's kind of famous, and it's about two wolves. And so we're going to put it up here. There's two, it's about two wolves. It's the tale of two wolves. Now, it's the tale of two wolves because there's a grandfather and a grandson at this village. And it's, a, it's kind of a village where when the winter is coming that you need to prepare. And so there's the grandson, the grandfather, and they're doing some things to prepare for the winter. And the grandson is sitting there, and he's, he's watching everything his grandfather does. And they're having just kind of this bonding moment. And the grandson looks at his grandfather, and he begins to speak, and he says, Grandfather, can I ask you a question? Well, the grandfather's working, and he doesn't really turn, but he just nods his head. So the grandson says, Grandfather, inside of me, it feels like there are two wolves, and they're ravenous wolves. And as soon as the grandson mentions wolves, the grandfather slowly turns and locks his eyes on his grandson. His grandson says, these two wolves inside of me, one of them is an evil wolf. It is greedy and angry and violent and jealous and envious and fearful. Then the grandson kind of looked down and did that all shucks with his foot. But the grandfather, steely-eyed, looked at him. My grandson said, there's another wolf, and it's a good wolf. It's a wolf that is courageous. It is a wolf that is kind. It is a wolf that is generous. It is a wolf that is compassionate. It is a wolf that wants to make the world a better place. And then a look of concern came over this grandchild's face. And he looked at his grandfather straight in the eye. And almost in a whisper, he said, Grandfather, which one will win? And at this moment, the grandfather smiled slightly. And he reached out his hand and he put it on top of his head and he gave his hair a little shake of tough. And he went back to work. The grandson was stunned. And then his grandfather simply said as he continued to work, the one you feed the most. The one you feed the most. You see, in this parable, even the little boy understood that there was a me I want to be and there's a me I am. And he asked his grandfather a simple question, how do I become the me I want to be? Because sometimes there's two of me inside and I want one of them to win and I don't want the other one to win. How does it work? And here's the amazing thing. The grandfather shares some wisdom that we all, listen, listen, we all know this, but we just rarely ever say it. The grandfather says, whichever one you feed the most. And here's what's amazing about this parable in the 1800s that comes from the 1800s. Actually, in recent modern scientists, they've actually come up with a scientific name. They've proven that this actually exists. It's called cognitive dissonance. And we're going to put it up here on the screen. It's called cognitive dissonance. And you might be saying, what is cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is a scientific term that says holding two thoughts at the same time that are inconsistent with each other. And they say, listen, all people on every planet and every language and every socioeconomic, we all struggle with this. All of us struggle with cognitive dissonance, which means we hold two thoughts that are inconsistent. And now I'm going to move the screen, and we're going to put up some examples of what this looks like. How many of you have ever said, listen, I want to be a good friend, but man, I like feeling important when I gossip. I want to be healthy, but man, that ice cream, I want to eat the whole, am I the only one that wants to eat the whole bucket? Right? I want to be generous, but when I go to the store, I love to splurge on myself so there's nothing to be generous with. I want to be honest, but sometimes lying is convenient and it's easier. And this is the me I want to be, and there's the me that I am, and there's this gap in between. 
Scientists have discovered this, and they've, here's what they've discovered. They've discovered that people actually will feel physically uncomfortable in between these two things. And here's the $24 million question is, well, how do you help pick the good one? What is going to make the difference between being a good friend and gossiping? And here's what they discovered. And I'm going to put up the next slide. They said, you just add thoughts. You're just adding thoughts changes this. If you add thoughts, it changes this. Now here's the thing that the scientists discovered when you add thoughts. These thoughts can be any kind of thoughts. They can be crazy thoughts. They can be normal thoughts. They can be sane thoughts. They can be rational thoughts. They can be irrational thoughts. They can be truthful thoughts. They can be untruthful thoughts. They just need to be thoughts. And like, let me give you an example. You're with a crew of people, and they're all talking. All of a sudden, your friend's names come up. Now, your friend has confided in you about something that people kind of know about, and you know the juicy inside scoop, and you want to be a good friend, but you also want to go, listen, I'm in the end. You want everyone to think you're in the know, and you want them to like you, and you could hold their attention, and you would seem popular, and you know, you'd be like, everyone would look like, oh, you're it, and you're that. And so you want to gossip, and so what will decide whether you're a good friend and don't say anything, or that you will gossip it? It's what thoughts that you add to your mind in that moment. Do you add, well, if that was me, I wouldn't want my friend to say anything. I'm sure that they would be embarrassed. If they were here, what would I do? If you added those kinds of thoughts, you're probably going to be a, fr a good friend and not gossip. If you add other kind of thoughts like, you know what, they probably don't really care. You know, this is a, a moment, and you know what, like, maybe this will be helpful in the long run if I gossip. And, and you know what, I'm, these people like me, and I want everyone to like me, and, and they won't really care, and they'd probably do it to me. And so if you add those thoughts, you will probably gossip. And they can be crazy and irrational thoughts, like being healthy and binging on ice cream. I know I shouldn't eat the half a tub of ice cream by myself, right? You want to be healthy. You know that. So you know what you do? How are you going to decide whether you stop or you keep on binging? What well, thoughts that you add? Do I want to throw up later? You might not eat all of the ice cream, right? You're like, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to feel that guilt. I, you know, I want to look good in the summer. Like, I want to be healthy. I want my jeans to fit. When you add those thoughts, you're less likely to eat. But then you'll have some other thoughts, and these thoughts don't even have to be crazy. You can be like, yeah, I'll work out tomorrow. And if your spouse or your friend or your neighbor asked you when the last time you worked out, you'd be like, five years ago. You know you're not going to work out, but you'll rationalize, well, I'll, I'll work it off. Or you go, I'll eat the whole thing, but I won't have a dessert for the next two weeks. And you haven't had a, not had a dessert for two weeks for your whole life. And so that's irrational. And so what happens is, is what we move on comes from adding thoughts, regardless of whether the thoughts are crazy or true or real. It's what the grandfather said. Which one will you feed? Which leads us to a truth that you've experienced, I've experienced, we've experienced, and it's a truth that science tells us. As a matter of fact, if you're following along in your insert, we're going to put it up on the screen here. And it says, our input will always impact the result of our output. Woo! Our, no one's fired up. Like, this is a truth. Like, we don't like this. We don't like this, but this is so true. Listen, our input will always impact the results of our output. It is just the way God made life to work. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the problem. Come on, come on, come on. Like, like, if you're out there, you probably get a little smile, and you're probably thinking, I knew this. And here's why, because no one in their right mind goes, yep, mm -mm, that's wrong. Like, none of you are saying that. You're all going, duh, that makes common sense. Like, of course. The problem isn't in knowing this. Can, can everyone nod? Everyone nod. The problem is not in knowing this. You're nodding, right? Okay. Now here's what you're doing. The problem is not in knowing. The problem is in doing. Smile. The problem isn't in knowing this. The problem is in doing it. That our input will always impact the results of our output. And then it got me thinking. What kind of outputs or what kind of inputs are we surrounding our life with? Is the input that you and I are around most of the time really trying to help you and I become the me I want to be? I mean, are the inputs really for us? Are they, you know, is, is the music that we listen to, is it really for us and going to help us become the me I want to be? Is the news that we watch or listen to really going to help us become the me I want to be? Is, is the shows that we watch going to really help me become the me I want to be? Or are inputs really based on trying to be light? Or trying to get our money from us? Or trying to get us to buy into their bias so that we'll support their agenda? 
I mean, it got me thinking, how much of our input, listen, listen, how much of our input as we go through the day, I mean, how much of our input is from music? And like, listen, you can like Adele, you can like Drake, you can like Ed Sheeran. I just don't know how much of that's gonna help you become the you you wanna be. When you think about input for entertainment, Listen, all of us probably watch a little bit of Netflix and a little bit of Hulu, but I just want to know, do those shows shows on Netflix and Hulu really going to help you become the you that you want to be? And I know for a fact, watching those news channels, CNN and Fox and whichever is your flavor, I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong, but it surely hasn't helped America. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you hang out with your friends at the bar, if you hang out with your friends at the bowling alley, if you hang out with your friends at the gym, if you hang out with your friends when you're hunting, I want to ask you a question. Is the music, is the entertainment, is the friends, is the news input, is it going to give you the output? Is it going to help you become the you that you want to be? Now, here's where I have to give, give a disclaimer because I don't want to seem like one of those crazy preachers, Okay. There is no, listen, come on, it was fine, it's okay, smile, you can just, okay, it's good, okay? Listen, I don't want anybody to leave church going, Matt said I couldn't listen to music or watch Netflix. Like, that's not what I'm saying. Listen, a good song is a good song, you can listen to a good song. Listen, there are good shows and you should watch good shows and it's okay to have a little bit of entertainment. And you know, it's okay to get your news from somewhere and listen, we all have friends who aren't followers of Jesus. Listen, and this is where church people get crazy. This is where churches actually hurt people. This is where church gets it wrong because it's our input, not our isolation. And here's where church people just get it messed up. See, they want it easy. They don't want to have to work for input, so they isolate themselves from other people. But here's the funny thing. Jesus never isolated himself from people. Actually, Jesus did the opposite. Jesus left heaven and incarnated and came down and spent time with busted and broken human beings. So I don't understand if Jesus didn't isolate himself, why do followers of Jesus isolate themselves? This is not an isolation issue. This is an input issue. Can everyone nod their head? Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox and get back to why this is important. Which leads you and I to maybe one of the most important questions that we could answer in our lives. Do you and I have the kind of input that will lead to you and I becoming the me I want to be? Because the truth is, input will always impact the results of the output. And this is where I just, I always get fired up. This is why I wake up before my alarm. This is why I love God, Jesus, and the Bible. I mean, here's the amazing thing. We are not the first people to deal with this. God knew this would be an issue. Matter of fact, God addressed this issue. Matter of fact, as we launched this very series, one of the most influential followers of Jesus' name is the Apostle Paul. He encountered a risen Christ. He planted churches. He did miracles. I mean, he was all in for Jesus. And he admits and says that, listen, I struggle with the me that I want to be. Remember, we looked at a letter he wrote to a church in Rome. It's called Romans. But it was a a letter he wrote to a church like this that was mixed. We're going to put up here Romans 7. And he says, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Can I get an amen or is it just me? And what he's saying is, listen, there's a me I want to be and then there's a me I am and there's a gap in between. He's kind of being honest about what's going on. He said, I love God's law with all my heart. And then he goes on to say this, and I left this in here because it's pretty important. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. Now here's the amazing thing. The author Paul doesn't just identify the problem. He gives us the reason for the problem. That's what we discovered in week two, that we have default settings in our life. It's me, myself, and I. Those are the default settings. And those default settings are defective. When our default settings are me, myself, and I, we have the busted world that we live in today. And here's the amazing thing. The author doesn't just stop. He doesn't just tell us that the solution is a who, Jesus he tells us how transformation happened. Matter of fact, a little bit later in Romans 8, he begins to describe how you and I can become the me that we want to be, what transformation and change looks like. We're going to see this in Romans 8. He says, those who live according to the flesh, and this being our defective system, me, myself, and I, have their, what's that word? Their minds set what is on the flesh desires. Cognitive dissonance. We have our minds set on what the flesh desires, which means our mindset is on me, myself, and I. So if my default setting is me, myself, and I, your default setting is me, myself, and I, guess what's going to happen as we bump into each other? It's conflict in the brokenness of the world. And he says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. He goes on to say this. He says, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit, that means Christ lives within us. We've said yes to Jesus, um, and we allow him to live in our life, and God's presence comes and lives in us. Have their, what's, their, what's that? 
their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And then it goes on to say this, the mind governed by the flesh, which is me, myself, and I, so the mind governed by me, myself, and I is death. And not always necessarily physical death, just the death of becoming the me that I want to be. Which I would counter might be worse than physical death. Because you're alive, but you're not who you want to be, so you're just existing. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Becoming the me that we were meant to be. I love how there's this translation. I'm going to put it up here. It's the same verse, but I love how it puts it up there. It says this. If your sinful old self is the boss over your mind, it leads to death. But if the Holy Spirit is the boss over your mind, it leads to life and peace. Which leads us asking, who is the boss? What mindset will we have? Because input will always impact the output. What mindset? What is our mind thinking on? What kind of thought patterns do we have? Because here's what the scripture is telling us. How we think will always determine how we act. Let me say it one more time. How we think will always determine how we act. So if how we think is based on me, myself, and I, we're going to act a certain way. If our mind or our thoughts are based on what God has to say and God being at the center of our life, then we'll act a different way or act a certain way. Because how we think will always determine how we act. So this morning, I want to give us three brief observations. I know it's really hot in here. I, I don't understand. You know, we, we get no AC in this, uh, in this cold outside. There's no heat. But now it's nice and warm outside. We get heat. So we're all sweating. Everyone go like this with a thing. That's good. If you can wave it up front, I could use it. I'm sweating up here under the lights. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to make three really, really just brief observations so that you and I can go, listen, how can we change our mindset from me, myself, and I to a mindset that is set on God? How do we actually do that? And so here's my first observation this morning. And it's this, change requires change thinking. Like, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Matt, that's not rocket science. And I'm like, I get it. And like, we all agree with this. But my, here's my question. Change requires change thinking. How many of us actually work on changing our thinking? And as I was thinking, see what I did there? As I was thinking about this, I thought of what would be some good examples. And I love Henry Ford's quote. Henry Ford is the guy who built the first A model car, right? And he produced and did a line. And here's what he said. He said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, not a car. And so change came from change thinking. Think of Steve Jobs. Do you remember iTunes? I, I know it's so long ago and it seems like forever ago, but I remember when I was little, you have to listen to music on, on, on records or on vinyl or on like a cassette. And then all of a sudden, Steve Jobs on one commercial said it's like having 300 albums in your pocket. He changed how things were done because it changed thinking. Change requires changed thinking. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote us this thing of there's a me I want to be and then there's the me that I am, he actually talks about this a little bit later. In the same letter, he writes these words to people. And we're going to put up there Romans 12 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And here's what he's saying is, listen, the world's default setting is me, myself, and I, and we see the brokenness. And he's saying, listen, listen, listen. If you're following after Jesus, don't conform to the pattern of this world because the world only cares about me, myself, and I. And if you follow Jesus, that's supposed to be different. But it says, be transformed by the renewing of your... Because the author knows for you and I to have changed behavior, we need to have changed thinking, he says, to renew your mind. Now here's what's amazing. The Apostle Paul wrote this about 2,000 years ago. And recently... Certain studies have come out and they've confirmed that you can actually transform or be changed by renewing your mind. We actually have a scientific term for it. Like, this is amazing. There's a scientific term and it's called neuroplasticity. Matter of fact, I was doing some research on like CEOs. And I came across this article in Forbes and I think it's, it's really interesting. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Um, it's Neuroplasticity Forbes, August of 16. It says, the human mind is a fascinating thing and it is far more flexible than we assume. And so what the author wants you to understand is, listen, CEOs, listen to people who are older, listen to people. You think maybe you're kind of stuck in a rut, but your mind is able to change. It's more flexible that you can believe. You can actually change your thinking so you can become a changed person. And the article continues going, the mind can transform over time. 
This isn't the Bible. This isn't religion. But this is Forbes talking to executives. Learning to cope with everything from daily challenges such as stress to catastrophic or even catastrophic injury. It goes on to say, the flexibility has a name, neuroplasticity. I mean, what the author Paul is telling us is to transform ourselves by renewing our minds, to change our default setting from me, myself, and I to what God thinks is really important. Matter of fact, the article continues to go on and it says this, put simply, your brain has the amazing ability to reorganize itself and create new neural pathways and expand neural networks. One simple way to create these pathways is to change your occurring. It says, listen, if you want to change the way that you think, you have to change your inputs. If you want a different output, you have to change your inputs. This is where you should be smiling. You know what this means? Go, come on, smile. This means that anyone can experience change. This is what's so amazing about grace. That regardless of where you're at, you and I can move from where we are to where God wants us to be to where we want to be if we'll simply change how we think. Listen, I just want to be real honest. There will be no change in your life if you do not change how you think. It is a biblical fact and it is a scientific fact. And so if you want to believe differently, that's okay. But those are the facts before us today. So if you want to have change, have change thinking. If you want those that you care about and you want to become the me that you want to be, then you'll need to change how you and I and we think. Which leads me to observation number two, which is this. Adding God's thoughts to our lives can rewire our thinking. See, we need to add God's thoughts to our lives. It'll rewire our thinking. Here's why we need our thinking rewired. And I don't know about you, but this is just the way it is. I grew up this way. You grew up this way. And we grew up with a defective system that says me, myself, and I. We may have grown up in church. We may have grown up wherever. And we may have been great parents. But the reality is, is that our default settings are me, myself, and I. And for many of us, we live that way a long time, Right? And what we really have to do is we have to rewire. And so to get away from that, we need to get rid of our thoughts. And here's why we need to move away from our thoughts. Because our thoughts always lead to our standards. Nod your head like you understand what I'm talking about. See, our thoughts create our standards. And your thoughts create your standards. And your thoughts create your standards. And the problem is they're all different. And we all hang around. That's why we have the broken world. Because me, myself, and I will create standards that I like for me. But when we add God's thoughts into our lives, what happens is we move from me, myself, and I, or my standards, to God's standards. And when we live up to God's standards, it changes how we behave and it changes how we impact the world. I like what Psalm 119, 9 through 11 says. It says, how can a young person stay pure? Now, I think this is a pretty important question because when you're young, this is one of the hardest things to do. And some people say, man, it's hard the whole life. And I'm going to say amen to that. How can a person stay pure? By obeying your word, which means you have God's standard. You didn't pick me, myself, and I as the standard. You picked God and added his thoughts. Obeying your word, I have tried to find you. Do not let me wander from your commands. Again, it's his standards, not our standards. And then it goes on to say, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What this author has said is, listen, if you want to end up and be the me you want to be, You can't have you be the standard. There's got to be a standard higher than that. You should add God's thought, which will create his standards, and that will change the way that you behave and the way that you live. I was thinking about this, and I don't know. How many of you have ever played a game on a phone? Anybody ever played a game on a phone, like got a phone app? Okay, like some of you, not enough of you. You should join the 21st century, right? And some of you are like, oh, this is boring and waste of time. And So it's okay. Anyway, uh, I used to play this game on the phone, and I'll just be honest what it was. It was Pokemon Go. I, I, I had fun. I liked it. I got into the craze. Woo, right? Um, but originally when the first Pokemon Go came out on your cell phone app, it had something called a bug. And you can get a bug on software. You can get a bug on a computer game. You can get a bug on your phone. You can get a bug on anything digital. And what happens is when this bug came out, it caused, it caused the game to crash and be no fun. People got mad. It was, it was just miserable. And then they came out with something called a patch. And you know what a patch is in software terms? It means they fixed what was broken. They rewired the way the thing was so that it would work the way it was supposed to. And see, here's the reality. You and I have some defective wiring. It's me, myself, and I, which causes us to have our own standard. And you and I need a patch. We need God to step in and we need to add his thoughts into our lives so it has his standards so we can end up becoming the me that I want to be. 
And that would seem so simple, but it leads me to observation number three, if I was very honest, which is we have to own our faith, not outsource it. Now, this is going to be the part that no one's going to like me, okay? I'm just going to tell you right now, you're about to hate me for the next five minutes. So please don't throw anything, but I'm telling you this because it is true. It may be hard, but I'm so sorry. I just have to tell the truth. We have to own our faith and not outsource it. And here's what I mean. Human dignity. See, God gives us human dignity. We, des- we want human dignity from other people. We want it from God, which means that you and I have to do our part. Human dignity means God's not going to strike you with a lightning bolt. He's not going to brainwash you. He's not going to zap you. You and I have to partner with God to do our part to become the me that I want to do. But you know what? If we were really honest, many of us, you know, that seems like work. Right? And we don't want to do it. Like, can-, can we just be honest? We just don't want to do that. We'd rather just God like wave his magical heavenly father hand over us and for us to do it. Because, but that would rob us of dignity and he's not going to do that. And we have to own our own faith and not outsource it. Listen, I need to say something and this is, this is so important. Listen, listen, like I'm supposed to help you in your journey. But I am not responsible for your walk with Jesus or your spiritual journey. Your spouse is not responsible for your spiritual journey. Your mama, your daddy, your grandpa, your neighbor... The politicians are not responsible for your spiritual growth or you becoming the you that God meant for you to be. You are supposed to, you have to own it. And, and here's what I discovered, here's what I, here's what I discovered. You know why people, people don't want to own it? It's because, listen, they get bad examples and they use bad examples as an excuse to bail out. They, seriously, come on, like, like, listen, I knew a bad preacher one time. I knew a church that did this. I knew somebody that ran off this. I had this Christian neighbor. They were bad and they were mean. I had this Christian teacher. You know, haven't you heard the news about how Christians did things wrong and they were bad and they were mean and, and they were cruel? And so I'm going to use a bad example and an excuse for me to bail and not have ownership of my faith. So I'm going to ask a really just quick, just quick question, just quick question. Okay, this is good. You're not going to like it, but it's good, okay? How many of you have ever gotten bad service at a restaurant? Okay, almost all of us, right? How many of you have ever gone back to a restaurant? Not maybe the same restaurant, but how many of you have still went? How many of you just, you, okay, you're lying. All of you should raise your hand. Because I've been out there in St. Mary's, right? Like, here's what happens. Just because you got bad service in one restaurant doesn't mean that you gave up on all restaurants. And here's the problem. Many of us have maybe had a bad experience with some Christ follower or some church or some pastor or somebody failed them, but we use that as an excuse that we can bail out and say, well, I don't have to be responsible. And here's the thing. You can do that, but do you know who the only person that it is that it hurts? You. Because whether we like it or not, our input will always impact the output. Which leads me to a conclusion, and I want to put it up on the screen if you're following along in your insert, and it goes like this, and it's coming, I promise. To become the me I want to be requires me to add the right kind of thoughts to my life. Now, I usually don't say this, but this is a time in the message where I want everyone to pull out their phone. Everyone pull out their phone. Go ahead. This is, you can pull it out. Like, don't answer it. Don't, you know, don't make it make noise. All right, go ahead and pull your phone out. Listen, here's what I want to challenge you to do. There's something called version. I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. There's something called version. It's a Bible app. It's free. You can download it on Android, iOS. You can download it on your laptop, I think. It's, it has all kinds of things. And here's what this thing does. version will send you a verse a day. Just go to your store. If you don't know how to do it, find a young person, a seven or eight-year-old, and they'll show you how to do it, right? Like, just... And so I actually have it on my phone. I actually have it. And every day I get a verse that comes up on my phone, right? I use this. And so here's my challenge. To have some kind of input from God. For the next seven days, would you download this? <coughs> and would you read and reflect on the verse? Just, just one verse. I'm not asking you to read a chapter. I'm asking you to read one verse that they'll actually send to your phone for the next seven days. I want to close with this because the timers tell me I'm done. Let me put a picture up here. Kodak, Blockbusters, and Lehman Brothers. Now here's the thing. Kodak, Blockbuster, and Lehman Brothers all used to be at the top of their game. At some point, they were all industry leaders. But something happened in their mindset, and they have all epically failed and gone bankrupt. I don't know if you knew this, but Kodak... 
that was around for a long time. Actually, a Kodak person in Kodak developed the first digital camera in 1973. And for some reason, people in Kodak said, no, 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 we'll lose business. We shouldn't go digital. Even though the world around it was going digital, they said, no, 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 we need to keep our old model. We need to be new with the old. And someone went to them and said, please change your mind. The world is going digital. We created the first digital camera. We could lead the way. And they were unwilling to change their mind, and they are gone. Blockbuster, how many of you have broke the speed limit? and raced to the store and yelled at the people to say, your thing's in the box, even though the door was closed, right? It's there. Don't give me a late fee. Like, am I the only one that ever did that with Blockbuster? <laughs> did you know that Blockbuster, Blockbuster originally was approached by Netflix to be in a partnership? I bet there had to be somebody on the board, somebody saying, listen, you should have an open mind. Maybe we should investigate this. Let's not have a closed mind. Let's open a mind. Maybe we should change our mindset because trying to get to the new with the old might not work, and it didn't work. Then you have Lehman Brothers. Man, they bought a bunch of mortgages, and they were allowing mortgages. They knew people couldn't pay it, and they did it. And I bet somewhere in the boardroom, I bet somebody was talking to these people and saying, you are out of your mind. We can't keep doing this. The bubble is going to break. And they said, no, 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 we're not out of our mind. It'll be good. We'll go into the new with the old. And the bubble burst. And they went broke. They needed to change their mind. They needed to open their mind or out of their mind. But they all had this in common. They needed to change their mindset. And they were unwilling to. And they all epically failed. And here's God's hope. Here's my hope. Here's our hope. Is that you would be willing to change your mindset so that you can become the you that you were meant to be. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that thousands of years before science confirmed what you said, you told us. You pointed away. You identified the real problem. God, that the default setting of me, myself, and I was broken. And God, that the answer wasn't in a what, but in a who, and his name is Jesus. And thank you that you showed us that the way to do it is to change our thinking, God, that, that our input will always impact our output, and that there's grace when we get it wrong, that there's forgiveness and mercy. But God, you want us to become the, the me's that we were meant to be, God. You have so much for us. Jesus, you died for us more than just to get to heaven, but for us to become who we were meant to be. God, may we be a people who add your thoughts, your input, your word to change our minds, to have your standards so that we can become who you meant for us to be. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.